Thank you. Hi hey everybody, um, I'm Philip and this is Devin. We're both grad students at Berkeley and we will show you a system that we've been working on. Um, we've been working on this together with a number of collaborators um, from Berkeley and also in industry. Um, for me personally, this is my first um, Python conference. I'm excited to be here and looking forward to meeting you and interacting with you. So, um, what is Ray? Um, Ray is a general purpose um, a, a framework for distributed Python. Um, uh, together with a number of higher level libraries, um, for um, uh, AI workloads. And you can think of uh, about Ray as something that um, you would use in the same way that you would use other systems like Dask or um, PySpark or Celery. So it's that um, um, type of system. And uh, it's used for parallelizing um, and distributing Python code. So here's the machine learning ecosystem today. Um, there are many important um, um, computational patterns that arise there. And maybe you think first of training, but it's actually much broader. Um, so things that um, important workloads that arise from machine learning workloads are um, uh, also serving, streaming, things like distributed reinforcement learning, um, data processing, and hyperparameter search. So today, each of these systems is um, uh, uh, implemented as a, stand as a standalone distributed system. Um, here's some examples of um, systems that people use. So they may use, for example, Horovant for distributed training, and maybe Clipper or TensorFlow Serving for serving. Um, and then they use things like PySpark or Dask for data processing. And um, each of these systems are specialized and very good at what they do. Um, but this poses a serious challenge for applications that are cross-cutting, that um, uh, need a lot of these uh, different capabilities. So um, this is especially true for um, a class of um, uh, applications called reinforcement learning. Um, which is an area of machine learning um, which aims to learn how an agent should act within the, uh, the in environment. Um, and um, in these sort of applications, maybe you have heard of systems like AlphaGo um, from DeepMind or um, Dota from um, OpenAI. Um, these components are all very tightly coupled together within the same application. And so this is the problem we address. Um, so um, building um, emerging machine learning and reinforcement learning applications um, requires stitching together all of these systems. Um, and uh, these are typically not um, designed to interface with, with each other. Um, so this makes it hard to transfer data across the system and also um, to um, bring together these various systems in terms of fault tolerance and in terms of cluster management and so on. And this then places a burden on the application developer. Um, so, uh, many, um, so therefore many machine learning researchers actually build custom systems um, to support their workloads. Um, so we are moving from this, uh, from this paradigm, where each component is a standalone system, um, to uh, um, something where we have one unified system to support all of them. Um, and um, so the real potential um, comes from uh, applications that uh, use a lot of these um, uh, capabilities in one application. Um, so we are also building uh, not only the system, but also the libraries on top of it. So, for example, we have um, a pretty mature uh, reinforcement library, running library at this point, and we have a pretty mature hyperparameter search library. We are working on a, a library for distributed training and also for data processing, which we will um, look into later. Um, so, um, how, what, uh, how does the system work? So, on top, there's all these libraries, and then um, we provide two abstractions, two main abstractions, which mirror the way that people <coughs> typically do um, programming. So you write programs by writing functions and writing classes. And um, we um, allow you to easily distribute both of these concepts. So for functions, uh, we have tasks. Um, these are stateless um, uh, functions that can run anywhere in the cluster and can be used for things like data processing, for example. Um, it's also, for many of these workloads, it's also very important to support um, stateful computation. And for that, we provide, um, we make it easy to distribute classes, and these are then so-called actors, which um, are classes uh, that can live anywhere in the cluster and can be used to um, distribute stateful things. For example, parameter servers, or um, think about a reinforcement learning um, simulators, where it could, for example, be a game, um, which has some internal state, and uh, this needs to be kept around in the cluster, and it's a long-running process and that you can interact with. Um, this is all built on top of one um, uh, backend, which is written in C++, and that's um, a dynamic task graph abstraction. So this is uh, used to um, get all the performance and also um, provide one unified um, fault tolerance mechanism that allows you to easily recover from failures. So let me talk a little bit more about the Array API now. 
Um, and uh, later in the tutorial, um, you will all be working on exercises and go through how to actually parallelize applications with this API. So the starting point here, we want to make it very easy to take existing applic Python applications and then distribute them. So the starting point here is functions. Um, for example, a function which um, uh, calculates a zero matrix and another function which um, computes the dot product of um, two matrices. And in order to distribute them, you um, put uh, in front of it this um, array of remote decorator. And this makes the function into a remote function, which can then be executed anywhere in the cluster. To invoke it, um, you call um, a function name dot remote of some arguments, and this will immediately um, uh, start the computation in the background and return a, a future. Um, so we call this an object ID, um, and you can launch uh, many of them in parallel, and uh, they will immediately return control, and uh, the um, uh, framework will then schedule it in the background. So in this case, we launch two tasks, and then you can pass these um, futures into other tasks. Um, and then the scheduler will keep track of the dependencies, as you see on the right-hand side, um, and will schedule um, the tasks as the dependencies become available. So in this case, we submitted the, um, uh, the matrix product between these two zero matrices. And then at the end, when you're done, you can call write up get, um, which is going to materialize the um, object, and it might transfer it from a different node, um, and uh, you will just have a Python object then. Um, in the background, Ray um, uh, constructs this computation graph, which is also used for fault tolerance. So if one of the nodes goes down and some data is lost, for example, Ray will figure out what is the best way to reconstruct it, and then um, uh, um, uh, it will transparently recover from the failure. So this is um, almost half of the API right there. So the API is very simple. This was the task API. Let's now talk about the actor API. So actors are about um, uh, stateful services. Think about a web server or a parameter server, key value store, or some reinforcement learning simulator, for example. And um, you, use, um, uh, you use a Python class, and you um, uh, put in this at rate of remote decorator. By the way, for these decorators, both for tasks and actors, you can also specify resource requirements. So in this case, we say number of GPUs equals to one. So Ray will schedule the actor on a node which has a GPU. So in this case, it's a simple counter actor, which has an increment method. So we can instantiate the actor with actor name.remote. This will create a Python process somewhere in the cluster and will make an instance of the class. And then we can um, uh, call method on it. So in this case, we call the increment method, um, and then we call it again. And then we can also um, get results. Um, so a note that these two uh, APIs are seamlessly integrated. So you can um, launch um, actors. You can uh, uh, pass actors into tasks. You can um, pass results from tasks and results from actors are really the same thing. So you can pass each of them to tasks and actors. Um, OK. So let's now talk a little bit about the architecture that um, uh, we use to support this. So the um, requirements here are actually um, pretty high. Um, for many of these reinforcement learning um, uh, applications or AI applications, you really need to do a lot of compute and also um, potentially a lot of data transfers. So for example, for distributed training, every um, couple of milliseconds, you need to synchronize the gradients between machines. Um, and for example, for the reinforcement learning applications, you need to do maybe um, hundreds of thousands of simulations um, per second. Um, and so how do we support that? So um, here's an example of a small cluster um, with uh, three nodes. And uh, there's a number of processes running on these uh, nodes. One is called the driver. So that's, uh, um, it could be an IPython notebook, for example, or it could be some uh, script that you're running. But this is the um, uh, process that um, launches the computation. And uh, you can submit um, tasks through it. And then there's a number of worker processes. These are the ones that are executing the computation. Uh, note that the Ray computation model allows you to do things recursively. So um, the workers can also launch uh, new tasks. Um, this makes it distinct from other paradigms, like, for example, Apache Spark. Um, so then, um, each node also has a uh, so-called object store. So this is a shared memory segment, which can be used to um, share the data um, between all the processes in one machine. This is especially important in the modern setting, where on the cloud, for example, we typically have many cores per machine. Um, and so this is an important optimization, because if you have, uh, say, 64 cores, you don't want to have 64 replicas of your data. Um, and we are collaborating with a project called Apache Arrow that you might be fam familiar with, um, which we use for serialization, um, which supports this um, shared memory um, paradigm very well. And then we wrote a Python serialization library on, on top of that, which um, makes it possible to expose these Arrow data types as Python um, data. 
Um, the object store actually um, uh, uh, has now also been merged into Arrow um, because we think that it's a component that can also be very useful for many other systems. Okay, then there is um, uh, uh, an object manager per node which does the data transfer between the nodes. It reads directly from the object store and can write in, into an object store on a different machine. Um, and then there is um, one scheduler per machine. Um, so um, our scheduling architecture is uh, what we call um, bottom-up scheduling. So if a task is submitted on a machine, the scheduler will first see if there's enough capacity on that machine. So if the um, uh, data objects are local and if there's a slot um, on one of the CPUs, and if, if that's the case, it will immediately um, schedule it on the same machine. Um, if not, it will figure out um, where to transfer it and then put it on a different machine and then it will be executed there. Um, there's uh, this um, component that we call the global control store. Um, this is actually a very, it has proven to be a very useful and powerful system design. So this is a database. We use actually red, uh, sharded Redis. And um, it stores all the metadata about the computation. So things like the computation graph, which tasks have been executing, and stuff like that. Um, this makes it possible for all the other um, uh, components of the system to be essentially stateless. Um, so this um, makes, uh, makes the system more scalable because um, you can start um, new processes that can pick up um, what is in the global control store and um, take uh, work and then um, process it. Um, it also makes it much easier to make the system fault tolerant because um, each of the processes is stateless. So if one node crashes, then we can just restart um, the process and it will connect to the global control store and uh, reload the data from there. It also makes it very easy to um, uh, uh, debug the cluster. So um, we have been building tools. Um, you will see the web UI um, uh, as part of the tutorial. And you can easily inspect um, the cluster state, see um, which tasks are being run, and um, uh, seeing error messages and things like that. <coughs> OK. Um. Right. So um, data processing is something that's kind of an important part of the machine learning lifecycle. Um, and so we've been working on a library in, for data processing on top of Ray. Um, so to talk a little bit about the motivation for like, how we approach this problem, I kind of want to take a look at like, the, the data science landscape. We have this issue where we're building, we're building tools on the large scale, terabyte plus, but they have different APIs, different requirements, even different skill sets that they require than tools that everybody knows and is familiar with at kilobyte, megabyte, even low gigabyte range. So, <clears throat> so there's kind of this disconnect where I can't use my tools that I learned and I've been using for years on terabyte data, and the tools that are made for terabyte data actually perform worse on small data than these other tools. So I end up having to use different tools on different data sets to do the same exact thing. This seems counterproductive. So we took the approach of accelerating pandas by changing one line of code. The one line of code is the import statement. So normally you would import pandas as pd. Instead, you import modin.pandas as pd. Um, the approach here is effectively to allow you to use all the cores on your machine and soon in a cluster and still keep that one line of code change. Um, it's very easy to install. Just pip install it. <coughs> so when we look at the pandas API, the Pandas API is actually massive. That's partly why it's so widely used, is because it's very rich. It covers a lot of use cases. It's, it's just it's a very powerful API. But if we look at data frame 280 plus methods series, 280 plus methods, and then there are all these operators that people use, uh, concat, things like that, that are useful for other things, 40 plus. So if you're going to do this one line of code change and had, had this kind of idea, where would you even start? Well, we decided to take a data-driven approach, look at what the community is using, do a study. So we did a, a giant scrape of Kaggle. We took, we took basically all the notebooks that people use to enter competitions and to teach and to learn and to play around even. And we figured out what people use. And what we found is that there are a small set of operations that people use very frequently, and then there's this kind of long tail of operations that end up being used very few times. But after we had the study, 
Now we can just implement things in the order of their popularity. And then we have a good idea of our coverage <coughs> instead of going, going after things that kind of make us look good, if that makes sense. So currently, we support 71.77. That's very exact, honestly. <laughs> but 71% uh, of the Pandas API, which represents about 93% of usage based on our study. Uh, series is not yet distributed, but the full API is supported. Um, but as we continue building out like this distributed 1D object, we're going to be able to actually scale a lot of operations much better. You can think of like group by and things like that. Um, Multi-index also has preliminary result. But now you may be looking at this and wondering like, well, what happens if I fall within that 30%? That's, that's actually quite a bit, right? Well, now you can default to pandas in Modin, actually, as of this past week. So, um, covariance is something that people use, but it's something that less than half a percent of people used in our study. So, we haven't implemented it yet. And you see, whenever you run this, you get this nice warning that says, defaulting to pandas implementation. That lets you know that there's going to be a performance penalty, effectively, for converting a, an object to a singular pandas data frame, performing the, op <coughs> performing the operation, and then converting it back. We do convert it back at the end so that you can continue using a lot of the distributed operations. Um, so, yeah. So, um, so um, Ray is an open source system. It's available on GitHub. Uh, you should check it out, and you are going to use it, obviously. Um, so um, we've been uh, having, an, uh, since uh, the initial release last May, uh, we have an uh, increasing number of contributors. Um, and also, there's an, um, an increasing number of production use cases at various companies who we are working with. Um, and yeah, so we will go through um, the tutorial um, together. Um, uh, for everybody who is uh, watching this video on the internet, um, you can go to this um, uh, URL and uh, check out the, um, there's a number of IPython notebooks there. For everybody here, um, to make it as smooth as possible, we actually have set up um, a, uh, on the cloud, we have set everything up. So you can go to this uh, website and then use the password to log in. Um, Does anybody have any questions? Yes. So you showed us how you're taking uh, pandas and turning it into a distributed, or, or allowing us to work with it as we would with Spark. Are you doing the same thing from like things that we do with Spark that are not going to be we're going to be able to do like with high Spark or just the Scala implementation and then like do that with the modem? So uh, give me an example. Uh, I am. I'm running a like FP growth like, I see. model on top I see. of uh, some baskets or something. So right now we're really focused on, so the question was, are we planning on extending this beyond data frames to maybe some machine learning algorithms or something like that? Um, and the answer is, right now, no. Um, we're, we're mainly focused on the, the data frame abstraction right now. Um, basically, the challenge is that like, 80% of a data scientist's time is spent cleaning and, and like collecting and extracting data. Um, and so that's kind of why we focused on the data frame, because a lot of people <coughs> tend to use the data frame extraction to, to do this kind of thing. So, uh, yeah. Good question. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, I find I tend to run out of memory before compute becomes a problem. Are there plans to incorporate that, or that be more like working in mind with a tool like Dask? Uh, what do you suggest for those types of circumstances? Right, so, um, and you're talking about this in the context of a data frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the question was, memory is a problem whenever I'm, like, rather than compute, memory is more the, the bottleneck for, you know, operating on large, large data sets. Um, so, yes. Since, so, right now, we, we have a similar architecture to Dask in that we, we, um, we do have pandas stored in our, like, remote partitions, if you will. Um, but our architecture overall is, is quite different. Um, in the future, the, the data frame will be strictly using Apache Arrow's representation, which is you know, an in-memory columnar format. It can be compressed and things like this. And so you'll get, you'll, get a lot more, like, you'll get a lot more distance out of the memory that you do have. Um, out of core is also something that we plan on supporting to where, you know, we don't have this support natively yet. It, it's not something that would be, 
you know, terribly hard to implement, really. But um, in the future, we're definitely going to have this this out of four and this you know much smaller memory footprint, even per partition. So. Yep. So, um, got two questions. The first is like your number one utility was was pandas read CSV, which I assume like in a large data environment, people aren't reading like 30 terabytes of data out of CSV. So, how, from a development perspective, how do you think about? Well, these are common, but they're common because the data is small. And like, how do you map to the things that you want to develop? So, to get a sense of where this is going in the future. Yeah, yeah. So, well, I mean, in the future, we're going to support the full eight pandas API. But um, let me repeat the question for a second. Uh, so, the question was: We have we've shown that read CSV is the most popular pandas function, but that's just because pandas is inherently single node, and maybe the Kaggle data sets are also more triggered towards or more more biased towards CSV data. Um, so, yes, our target our target initially was helping Pandas users effectively get over this bottleneck of being able to use Pandas. Um, but at, you know, we're, we're moving into the point where we're starting to transition to more large-scale things, cluster, cluster support and that kind of thing. And supporting the full Pandas API, really, really it will give us the kind of, like, all the data ingest. Data ingest is something that, that we're always working on anyway. So. Um, does that answer your question? Sort of. Okay. Do you, do you want to ask a follow up so that I can? Yeah, we'll do it later. Okay, sure. Yes, in the back. I have a follow up. Okay. So, like, naturally, SQL alchemy becomes one of the key thoughts about data, you know, import into your system applications, various other things. And, you know, the post dating CSVs, like you say, I'm probably going to want to hit a cloud DB or a data lake or whatever to the source. There, have you guys explored into the different, you know, open source database, ODBCs, or, or is there other back component of Pandas to the SQL alchemy and any challenges to speak of? So, so not yet. So for, for when, whenever you, so we've only like highly optimized uh, a few things, read CSV and Parquet, effectively. Um, the rest of them actually just default to Pandas, and so any behavior that Pandas actually supports will be supported in that ingest. That's not going to be the case forever. Um, but you know, the, the project is only eight months old or so. <laughs> so um, as we continue, you know, as it matures, of course, the you know the things that we support and the the performance will of course. So. You had a second question. Yeah, it was sort of more about Ray. Um, you know like I get where Modin is starting this thought process. Like the very specific problem is a problem that I have. Um, what was the, like the nugget that starts your development of Ray? What particular part of the machine learning development problem you, did you find so painful that you, you decided to do this? Yeah, so um, um, my background is actually in machine learning um, and AI applications. And um, I've been working on uh, several applications where um, the computer is a bottleneck. Um, but uh, typically this involved, um, for example, um, uh, um, building like a, uh, using a simulator to learn um, robotic walking in a, in a simulated environment. Um, and this would take, I mean, even though so I, um, uh, 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 I was parallelizing this with um, Python model processing on a like, pretty large node, but it took like eight hours, for example, to do the training run. And so, um, uh, Finding a good solution for these sort of applications where it, it involves a lot of different pieces, um, like simulation, and then you need to serve the model, you need to update the model via some training. Um, uh, that, that's sort of the uh, initial starting point for that. So, for example, for the walking thing, um, um, I've then later implemented this in Ray, and uh, you can actually now train the same walking in like a little bit over three minutes. So, that's a pretty nice speed up. Um, and, uh, and there's many actually emerging um, these sort of um, applications. For example, AlphaGo or the, um, maybe you've seen like Dota from OpenAI, where you need to integrate all of these things together. And so the existing systems um, didn't really have the right performance characteristics for this. So to um, provide one system that can support a very wide variety of workloads, um, that's the motivating, um, the motivation behind Ray. Are there any more questions? 
So have you been able to log into this? Yes. Um, is there anybody who has problems? Please raise your hand. Amazing. Okay. So let's go through the first um, tutorial together. Um, so um, uh, this is, uh, there are many more exercises than we will be able to um, go through. Um, so uh, uh, as I said, it's uh, online. So um, if you're interested, you can go through them at your own pace later. Um, but for now, let's start with this exercise M01. So all of the exercises um, have uh, a description that you can read and it will guide you through um, what you need to do. So this is a very simple um, uh, data parallel example, which um, uh, shows us how to make a function into a remote function. So typically how the exercise are structured is, first um, we import a bunch of things, um, and then typically it has some, something already defined for you that you want to speed up. So in this case there's this flow, slow function as a um, proxy for slowness which has uh, sleep for one second. And then um, it's uh, being called a number of times. In this case, we just call it four times. And we take, um, with uh, time to time, we take the, num the amount of time it takes. Um, and then it tells us uh, there's a number of results, and it took four seconds. Um, and then there's typically part of the exercise where it verifies if what you did is correct. So in this case, we um, evaluate this. And then it says um, assertion failure, the, it's too long, the, the, it's too slow, the time was too long. So now we are supposed to parallelize this using Ray. So um, how we do this is, we um, put the addRay.remote decorator in front of the function, which makes the function into a remote function. And then um, when we call it, we say function.remote. And then at the end, we need to call ray.get. So now we can evaluate um, it. Um, oops. And in this case, we forgot to evaluate this. Um, and then um, we can see if now the assertion passes, and uh, it passes. So this was an extremely simple example, that's just the first step. And then in the second exercise, um, You will actually um, uh, do the same thing, but um, for task dependencies. So you, uh, there will be multiple tasks, and they will call each other, and there will be dependencies um, passed um, through. So I suggest that you go through these things at your own pace, and the two of us will walk around and help um, if there's problems. And you should just raise your hands um, if you run into any trouble. <laughs> Attention everybody, uh, we have uh, two more minutes to wrap this, uh, this session up, so uh, uh, thanks a lot uh, Philip and Devin uh, for the amazing uh, tutorial, uh, please uh, Everyone, let's uh, give them a round of applause.